It's wonderful to see a full house here at this high auditorium uh, here at Herbert. Uh, and I also want to wish a good evening, or for those of you who chose to get up very early uh, in the morning, a good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, in Asia who are choosing to tune in to the live webcast. Um, I'm Mark Wu. I am the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies uh, here at Harvard, and I have the pleasure of welcoming all of you to one of our showcase events this fall, a discussion on China's new politics, what have we learned from the 20th Party Congress. Uh, I'm going to take a minute first just to introduce the panelists, uh, wonderful experts we have here at the Fairbanks Center and at Harvard. Um, and then um, I'll also take a couple of minutes recognizing there are students here in this audience, not all of you follow Chinese politics uh, at a sort of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, sport-like level, um, just to make sure that everyone uh, understands what transpired uh, over, the, uh, over uh, the developments of the 20th Party Congress. And then I'll open it up really for just a um, conversation amongst our panelists, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, for, for you and Beth, um, there are still a couple of empty seats here in front, um, so please do come down and take advantage. I know um, the habits of not wanting to sit in the front row are hard to break for students, <laughs> but definitely I think um, this is one you'll want to be uh, more in the room here uh, for, and definitely there's still plenty of empty seats up here in the front row. Um, so uh, I'm just going to introduce my panelists in order here. Uh, to my left, first is Joseph Huffman. Joe is the professor of international relations and political science at Boston University. He's also a center associate here with us at the Fairbank Center. He's the author of Rethinking Chinese Politics and also more recently, Forging Leninism in China. Um, to his left is Lucy Hornby, who's a visiting scholar here at the Fairbank Center and also a Foreman Neiman Fellow. Here at Harvard, uh, she covered Asia for 15 years for the Financial Times, including serving as the Deputy Bureau Chief in Beijing. Uh, to her left is Tony Seish, uh, the Daewoo Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Director of the Raja Wally Foundation Institute for Asia, and the former Director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Um, he is the author of From Rebel to Ruler, 100 Years of the Chinese Communist Party, and to his left is Yu Hua Wang, the professor of government here at Harvard and the author of a forthcoming book, The Rise and Fall of Imperial China, as well as um, Tying the Autocrat's Hands. And so I just want to say for those of you who are looking to build out your Amazon book wish list, uh, for those of you looking uh, to buy holiday books, uh, for friends who are interested in Chinese politics, uh, hopefully I just uh, made your lives a little bit easier. Um, I also want to draw your attention to a new infographic that we created here at the Fairbank Center um, with uh, kudos to James Evans, our communications director, as well as uh, Yuan Zhuo Wang and several um, students um, who were involved in the research for this effort. I see several of you breaking out your phones, but I just want to make you aware that if you go on the Fairbank Center website, <laughs> um, you can easily download this <laughs> and it will come into much sharper resolution. And you can also still post this on your Instagram or your Twitter <laughs> feed um, as you may like. Um, one of the things about this infographic is it will show you sort of in visual format um, who's who within both the core leadership, as well as the Politburo Standing Committee, as well as the Central Committee, and it broken down also by functions. As far as we understand it, many of these functions, of course, um, will uh, be determined formally in the spring 
um, once uh, the second the second of the major events uh, the, uh, takes place. Um, to contrast this, uh, James and Yuan Zhuo also created an infographic of the CCP's leadership prior to the 20th Party Congress. So you can also download that infographic uh, at the Fairbanks Center's website. And that also allows you an easy visual way to sort of do a compare and contrast uh, between those as well. And so I'll leave this up because we may refer to certain individuals during the course of today's talk. Um, but let me just take a couple of minutes just to set the stage, especially for those of you who may not follow Chinese politics um, in as close form as those sitting here or those of you in the audience who um, are choosing to focus on this for your dissertations, um, your senior thesis papers and the like. Um, basically, China's Communist Party um, holds a party congress every five years. Um, this is a major event that determines the leadership structure for several key organizational parts of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it includes a general secretary's report, uh, which provides a vision and direction uh, from the general secretary as to the CCP's uh, direction for the next five years. Um, it also determines um, a Politburo Standing Committee, which has been seven members uh, for both uh, this current term as well as the previous term. It had been as large as nine previously. There was a central committee um, this time, uh, which was reduced from 25 members to 24 members. And then there is the Politburo structure, uh, which is all elected and put into place. Um, it does also touch on reports concerning the military, um, and um, party discipline, other key parts of internal party members, uh, of party matters. Um, I want to contrast this with the state. Um, we oftentimes refer to the Chinese party state. Uh, the meeting in the spring will determine the formal roles within the state structure. So this will include determination of the premier, the vice premier, and various members uh, within the state council structure. And that's still to come. But this is, of course, the preview event that um, does highlight several things um, to be expected uh, about what we can expect in the next term. Now, I think it came as no surprise to any of us that Xi Jinping uh, was reappointed for a third term as the general secretary of the CCP. Um, however, there were several more busting elements of this Congress, um, one of which uh, is, of course, that there were no women on the uh, Central Committee. Um, the yes. other, I'm sorry, on the Politburo, yes. Uh, the uh, other is, of course, that um, that uh, some were surprised that a informal norm of um, retirement at age 68, but staying on at 67, the qi san ba xia norm um, did not apply to certain members, including uh, most pointedly um, Li Keqiang, who stepped down uh, as premier, which was to be expected, but some premiers have then moved on uh, to take on other roles within the standing committee. And then Wang Yang, who also had not reached that age, and some have expected that he might possibly stay on uh, within the standing committee. Um, there were others on the standing committee who did reach retirement age. And then, of course, um, Wang Huning and uh, Zhao Liji stayed on, on the, um, on the Politburo Standing Committee. And then there were four new members uh, who were appointed, each of which have ties, very strong ties to um, Xi Jinping uh, itself. Um, the other parts, uh, which I think will be discussed or highlighted, is, of course, um, the uh, emergence of Li Chang, uh, the party secretary in Shanghai. Um, as a number two ranking member, um, came as a surprise to some. Um, he, of course, um, is also then slated to likely become the premier. And should that be the case, um, it would be uh, the first premier in some time, I believe, since Li Peng, um, who will not previously served as a vice premier. And I believe also the first premier since Zhao Ziyang to have not taken on a formal role within the state council. Um, there are, of course, um, other matters which our experts uh, will highlight in the course of all this, but I want to start out with a very general question. Um, several of the developments, and in particular the uh, appointment of who stood on the standing committee and who was appointed to Politburo, and the absence of perhaps 
um, some individuals, such as Hu Chunghua, who have been the former vice premier, but tied very closely to the Communist Youth League faction and so forth, of not being on um, the Politburo. Some of this came as a surprise um, to uh, those who watched the developments very closely. So I just want to start by asking each of you, on a scale of one through 10, how surprised were you with, say, one being not very surprised at all, 10 being absolutely surprised? And what came as the biggest surprise for you? So why don't we just sort of go down in order, Joe, starting with you. Well, actually, I don't think that the results of this meeting were very surprising at all. There were a few things like the absence of Hu Chunhua that were a bit surprising, but I think we expected uh, Xi Jinping to totally dominate uh, the proceedings as he has Chinese politics for the last 10 years. Uh, I, I think, by the way, if you look at the age composition of the uh, Central Committee, uh, the likelihood is that he will be here for another 10 years. Um, whether he decides to go on after that will presumably be his own choice. Um, to me, the, the, the really interesting story of this is that in the, in the past, uh, you know, the, the press has always said unprecedented third year or third term. Um, what we're doing is going back to normal politics. Uh, with all due respect to your title, it's not what's new about politics, it's what's old. This is a return to old politics. Mao Zedong didn't step down, Deng Xiaoping didn't step, well, sort of did, but <laughs> he kept on uh, the 92 Southern trip and so forth. Jiang Zemin was told to step down. Uh, Hu Jintao had no choice. Um, so they didn't voluntarily step down. And so what we're returning to is sort of the norm of lifelong tenure. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, I think, had really made an effort to say, uh, Jiang Zemin for 10 years and over to uh, Hu Jintao, don't pick your own successor. That was the key for him to the over-concentration of power under Mao. And Xi, Jin, uh, Xi Jinping is the anti-Deng Xiaoping. Uh, he has decided to go back to picking your own successor if he ever lives long enough to pick his own successor. Uh, but in any case, to me, that was the really bottom line of this Congress. So shall I pick up from there? Um, I, I, whoops. I think journalists, particularly, the, like the idea of like factions battling it out, you know, because we try to make Chinese politics as interesting as we possibly can. <laughs> when nothing actually changes for five years. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it was a question of not that she would dominate, but as you said, by how much. Um, but this doesn't necessarily end factional politics, right? Because if you look at Chinese history, what happens is one person dominates, they bring in that faction, and then that faction splinters between very ambitious people, right? Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting that Xi Jinping brought his um, standing committee to Yan'an, and specifically he talked about the 1945 uh, Party Congress, which, you know, first of all, his father got elevated then, you know, so it had some personal thing, but it was also the time that Mao brought in his own people, right? And so subsequent factions in Chinese politics were between Mao's followers, but not Mao and people apart from Mao. Um, so I think that that's what we'll be looking forward to going forward. Um, and on that front, the only thing that really surprised me um, is that you know, there had been a lot of signaling in the direction of a gentleman named Chen Min R, uh, who you will see up there. He's got a Jay-Z next to him, which I'm not sure what that means. Um, but he Jiu is, Jiang. oh, Zhe Jiang, okay. So he's up there, um, Chen Min R. Um, there had been a lot of signaling that he was Xi's preferred successor. Um, the fact that he didn't jump into the Politburo Standing Committee is pretty interesting, um, but it also means there's room now for other people to try to outcompete him for Xi's favor. And I think this could lead to, you know, some really heavy zigs and zags in Chinese politics as people who want to be Xi's successor compete to look as obedient as possible to what they think Xi wants. Um, so altogether, it will make for, I think, a very destabilizing competition going forward. Thanks. Well, I identified Chen Minar 
at the 19th Party Congress as Xi's likely successor. So what the hell do I know? <laughs> um, so if we're just sort of focusing on the, the leadership, I, I agree obviously with much of what Joe said. Uh, three things uh, struck me really related to it, one of which was a bit of a surprise. The first, however, though, I, I always thought that whether Li Qiang would be appointed as the potential premier was a real litmus test of how far um, she was going to push loyalty over potentially competence or area expertise. And because of the way that Li Qiang's uh, government in Shanghai had so badly mismanaged, mismanaged COVID, uh, it didn't really create a lot of confidence about him being able to manage a very complex economy. But I think the fact that uh, despite all that, he's come out as the number two uh, in the rankings is, uh, is, tells us a lot about uh, Xi Jinping's thinking. Hu Chunhua is interesting, and I think the reason he was not included in the Politburo is simply that uh, he doesn't, she doesn't want him to be seen as a potential successor. Because if he'd remained in the Politburo or been in the Standing Committee, given his age and expertise, he might have been seen by many to be a potential successor. The one thing that did surprise me <clears throat> was that um, I don't think anybody analyzing before had anticipated all seven standing committee members would be really close to Xi Jinping. Um, I thought maybe six out of the seven, others five out of seven. That was the one thing that surprised me. And it does raise a different set of challenges from what Lucy just talked about, that eventually they're going to compete with one another to move forward. It is what do other opinion groups in the party do now, given that they are now completely out of having any formal voice into the most uh, senior parts of the party apparatus, what do they do? I mean, how do they express their opinions, their views? Do they work outside of the system, which of course is very dangerous, or do they just lick their wounds, skulk away, and hope that something goes very badly wrong with policy where they can reassert some of their influence? Well, to answer Mark's question from one to 10, how surprised I am, I would give a very precise answer. I think 1.43. <laughs> I'm a quantitative scholar. So uh, I think it's, uh, I'm not surprised by the overall outcome, but I, I am surprised by some of the personnel changes. For example, Li Qiang, one of the seven on the Politburo Standing Committee, that's why it's 1.43. It's a I want to highlight one of the things that, um, uh, my panelists have mentioned, I think, uh, you know, in the media after the party's Congress, you probably have seen this phrase many times, it's called the end of factions, right? And then this is back to the point that is, uh, before Xi Jinping, we used to think uh, there has been some arrangement, maybe informal arrangement uh, between the party elders that there has been some locations of factions that is, for example, you know, um, and there are different ways to call their names, but you know, I, for example, Prince Ling's in the Shanghai Bang, the Shanghai faction, and the Youth League faction, and then some people, for example, Chang Li and Victor Shi, um, and the political scientists have been using those labels to talk about factional politics in China. And then uh, it seems that uh, the politics at the time, for example, under uh, Jiang and under Hu, was that uh, the party elders will reach some agreement. For example, this time is the Youth League, next time is the Prince League, right? And then that has been probably the case. Um, from Jiang, you know, the Shanghai Bang, and then Hu Jintao, the Youth League faction, and then probably uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the so-called princely faction. But then this time, right, um, it seems that um, uh, in a lot of our newspaper articles call this the end of factions, and then because we, you know, she has achieved total dominance on the Politburo Standing Committee, all the all the six people on the uh, Politburo Standing Committee other than him are uh, sort of connected to him, right? you know, you can call them C faction, right? But I want to make the point that uh, you know, one of the surprising consequences, I guess, uh, in the years to come is, is probably the end of factions, but not the end of factional fights. Um, that is, when there was locations, when everybody understand that there might be law ruling, at least, you know, this time is the U.S. League, next time is the Prince League, every member of the faction knows that there's a chance in the future they might Get a promotion right? because there's a you know there's this rotation system and then the all party elders have agreement on which faction will be promoted next time and then so so people know that there's a there's a chance for themselves in the future 
And then the number of people in those smaller factions are also smaller. Right? For example, the, the number of people in the Princeton faction, number of people in the youth league faction are smaller compared, for example, the so-called C faction now. And then the, the, the situation I think he will face, the challenge I think he will face is that all his followers, all his proteges now belong to this broader umbrella faction called the C faction. And everybody uh, think that they have a chance of being promoted. And then that will increase the level of competition rather than reduce the chance of competition. Right? Because now the number of competitors everyone is facing is increasing rather than decreasing. So I think that uh, in the next 10 years or 15 years, I think when we see you know, the, the C faction dominating, it doesn't mean that there will be less faction class. Actually, there will be more faction class. Just want to ask if anyone wants to build on or respond to any of the surprises. Uh, if not, then let me um, highlight uh, what you, what you mentioned um, the fact that there's been a lot of media commentary on this, both in the Western media, but also um, in the Chinese language press. And if you count what goes on on uh, Weibo and Weixing and so on and so forth, a lot of commentary on all this. Um, you highlight the one thing that you think is a little bit off on that commentary. I just want to ask others, um, are there things that you want to draw to attention that uh, possibly has become part of the narrative about what unfolded at the party congress that you think isn't quite right or something that's been missing from the narrative but think is an important element yeah um you know i do agree i think with with you Hua, that it does set up a very unstable situation um because most of those people are going to feel as though they're equals in one way or another uh, even though there is a ranked hierarchy uh, the thing that struck me about the General Secretary's report, and I haven't really seen this covered so much in the press, is that I actually found it a very anxious report, full of anxiety and fears, and also actually a very defensive report. <laughs> I mean, the way I read it was a lot of it was about how do we confront the threat that we now see coming from America and the West. Mm -hmm. And I interpreted that in two different ways. One of which I think of as geoeconomic risk mitigation. And there, things like decoupling, um, the dual circulation, the BRI, I think sort of fit into that. And I think China's play there is that they figure great powers are the countries that dominate standards in key industries. And that's what you know, China is investing heavily in, and they see that as one way of pushing back against uh, uh, U.S. Uh, pressure on them. But then, of course, there's also the geopolitical risk mitigation, which is uh, behind one uh, China trying to take more uh, influence in international forums, and particularly um, pushing back in those areas where it doesn't agree with the norms, human rights being one obvious one, and of course, trying to build coalitions uh, with other countries that don't really uh, sign on to um, a uh, Western uh, dominated global order. So the obvious, most obvious example being, being Russia and, and so forth. So that's something that I saw in the report that I haven't seen commented on so much that in many ways, it's a kind of defensive reaction both domestically, but also internationally, uh, to the challenges uh, that he sees uh, coming at China in the future. And um, there were a lot of warnings in the report. It didn't strike me, you know, maybe he's confident in his power, but it didn't strike me that he was a confident leader at the present time. Well, judging by the reaction of a lot of Chinese that I know and talk to, uh, he shouldn't be terribly confident. Uh, this is um, maybe I have a very bad sample. Um, I'm not a statistician. Probably the same uh, sample uh, that I took. Think. <laughs> could well be. Um, but there are a lot of people who expected this outcome, but a lot of people who are just not happy about it. There's no enthusiasm for Xi Jinping. Uh, and nobody uses a uh, the sort of familial she da da anymore. It's all, it's all nigger in and all that, uh, you know, very impersonal. They 
he's not somebody who evokes a lot of warmth uh, among the Chinese people. There's no uh, charismatic authority there and so forth. Um, Maybe he uh, needs to go back to the bum shop again and buy his bounds. <laughs> Well, he got a lot of good play out he of that. Did. Yeah. You know, for 15 quiet, he got a lot of publicity. Um, one of the things that really strikes me as I think back over the years is whenever Deng Xiaoping had a problem in the party or internationally, he just said, let's grow out of it. Economy is first. Grow out of it and all these ideological problems that you guys are arguing about, the answer will become clear uh, you'll be friends and so forth. And Xi Jinping's reaction is totally different. Uh, he wants to circle the wagons. Um, uh, you know, the West is an enemy. There are enemies all over the country. Uh, you know, I remember reading an article of his a couple of years ago that said this decoupling sort of stuff that he was talking about. You know, this is going to cost us more. And the economy will grow more slowly, but it's the only way to preserve you know, national security. And he's really put such a great uh, weight on national security. Uh, and, you know, I think this does set up real problems for the next few years. Uh, uh, the economy has been slowing down for the last several years. It will probably continue to be growing at a fairly low rate. Uh, and I, I think you can only cry out national security so many times before people say, well, yeah, it would be nice to eat too. Um, <laughs> Youth unemployment is way up, uh, things of that nature. Um, so I think there's, especially in the technology field, Li Yuan had a wonderful article in the New York Times this morning, for those of you who've read it, uh, uh, commenting on how the, the technological entrepreneurs are really increasingly fed up and or maybe frightened is uh, the right word to use, that they're looking either to leave China or leave that field uh, get their families out, get their money out. Uh, that's not the sort of investment environment that you want going forward. So I would expect before very long, some of these people on the standing committee are going to say, well, don't we have to do something to support high tech? Um, which goes along with the technological issues that you're talking about. But he sees the answer that is more state investment into high tech. And that seems to be the approach. There is a certain amount of state debt. You know, well, there certainly is. I'm not saying it'll be successful, but that seems <laughs> to be the approach. Yeah. Lucy, maybe I can turn to you as someone who's covered the economy in debt. <laughs> I see sort of three different narratives emerging out of this, right? One is the one that Joe just alluded to, which is um, the Chinese economy is in for quite a bit of rough waters ahead. This would have been normally the state, even if, right, um, just as China's growing into a certain stage of development, that just becomes more difficult. But then we've got the COVID aftershock, right, uh, about all the slowing global economy and so forth. Um, and then just at this critical moment, right, you see talent and possibly capital leaving the country. That's one narrative. I hear a different narrative, which is, you know, this has been the case in sort of slow jerks and drabs. This is kind of more of the same, right? Sort of a doubling down, maybe national security, technology, uh, 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 this sort of focus on um, self-resilience. Um, and then I hear a third narrative, which is to say, uh, you know, she has wanted to carry out more on the economy than he's been capable of. Now he's cleared the deck. And maybe he'll actually be able to take care of some of what he's wanted to do in terms of dealing with the property markets, in terms of dealing with actual investment in certain sectors, in terms of channeling these types of resources. And so, you know, having someone like Khalifa in a key economic role, um, who has been a key architect of this sort of state-led mission, is actually going to sort of accelerate things and possibly be more of a reform type of outlook in the coming years. What do you make of all this? And where does your own instinct sort of take you? Okay, so first of all, um, slowing growth is not a bad thing, right? So imagine a balloon, right? The balloon is getting bigger, fast at first, and then as it gets bigger and bigger, it glows more slowly as a percent, right? Um, and so I think that this is kind of a misperception um, that hangs around the Chinese economy, right? As the Chinese economy gets bigger, you want it to grow more slowly. Right, because in absolute terms, 2% of a much bigger pie is bigger than 10% of a tiny little pie, right? Um, so it's natural that that growth would slow down, okay? 
Um, the problem China has had was that it was growing quite fast and then it turned the corner to growing quite slowly, kind of all at once, right? Um, and in the over the past 10 years, that's when that transition has happened. And at the same time, the strengthening of the party uh, over the economy has meant that um, the resources have been channeled away from the private sector. You know, um, a lot of private businesses, especially very small ones and medium ones, have been completely wiped out. Um, a lot of debt has defaulted and it's defaulted onto the pockets of the Chinese people, right? So those of you who are Chinese nationals, um, probably you have an aunt or a grandmother or a grandfather or a cousin who's lost a lot of money in Li Tai Tanpei, right? So it's basically been a giant default onto the middle class, right? Um, so, so that's the problem, right? It's not that the growth itself is slower, it's that it has slowed catastrophically for certain sectors. And at the same time, you've had a huge resources being channeled into the state's priority sectors. Um, and those tend to be security. Um, and especially with COVID, we've seen a huge buildup of the security state. Um, tech, in the sense that China is doing um, what to a certain extent the Japanese, the French and the Germans have done, which is identify key tech areas throw a lot of resources into them, but they haven't necessarily paid off yet, right? So there's a sort of a stasis there. It's a bet that might pay off, but it really might not too. Um, so, so that's kind of where the issue lies. Now, a second issue is that as you get a mature slowing economy, what you really wanna have is a lot of regional flexibility, right? So think of the United States, we have the Fed in many different cities, and that's so that we can reflect the fact that sometimes you know, Silicon Valley in California might be doing great, but St. Louis in the middle of the country might be doing terribly, right? So as China becomes a mature economy, you no longer have the situation that you had in the 80s and 90s when every single thing was growing like crazy. Everybody was getting a new car. Everybody was getting a new apartment. Um, now you have a situation where you need a more nuanced approach to a very large and a very complex economy. At the same time, you have this intense centralization of political power. And you have the attitude that the state should be what's allocating resources, right? Not where demand is from people. Um, so that I think is gonna be another huge challenge for the Chinese economy going forward, that there's a, a real contradiction built in um, between the flexibility that a big economy needs and the extreme centralization of Xi and the party's instincts. Um, and that applies to people movement as well, right? And COVID has just exacerbated that people within China find it really difficult to go from one city to the next, right? So you you have a very non-fluid labor market um, and all of this just makes it much more difficult. And I think you're gonna end up having a very large economy that's kind of lurching around uh, rather than necessarily responding flexibly. Anyone else wish to weigh in on what the party Congress means for the fund? I just want to make one uh, quick comment about, um, you know, there are a lot of predictions about the Chinese economy and you know, some are, I guess most of them are very pessimistic, but I want to say that, uh, you know, this is why politics is so important to understand the economy. Politics is important because uh, the political structure, the number of people in the decision-making process can determine how fast the state can make decisions. For example, uh, you know, when, you know, I talk about the factions and, you know, uh, in the past, um, when a top leader wanted to make an economic decision, right, it's a collective process. That is, you have to talk to people, maybe on the Politburo Standing Committee or on the Politburo, and then get a consensus, right? That's how it worked, you know, ideally how it worked. And then it means that in that process, uh, it, it, uh, it required consensus building and also required negotiating. And also uh, that process means that a lot of people on the Politburo Standing Committee, for example, could say no, right? You know, a single person, for example, maybe the Prime Minister, maybe the West Prime Minister, you know, can say no to a policy initiative. And then uh, what we are seeing now is the total dominance, you know, the C faction, for example. And then I think what that, what that means for economic policy making is what we'll see faster changes uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, which means, you know, we'll never see changes mind, we will see policy changes. And then uh, there will be very few people, right, uh, on the Politburo who can say no to any ideas that she has. And then and I think that 
that's important because it, it means that uh, it is difficult to predict. You know, my point is it would be very difficult to predict what would happen in the next 10 years right? because a lot of people will say, you know, this is Xi's policy and then, you know, Xi's preferences will dominate. That's going to be what's happening in the next 10 to 15 years. But my point is, uh, is it, exactly because um, Xi has achieved dominance, it means that there will be very few people who can say no, who can check the power of C. So C's mind can change quickly. And then once his mind changes, policies will change. So I think my prediction would be uh, very un unpredictable. And in the next 10 years, there will be a lot of sudden quick changes in economic policies. Yeah, the one thing I, I would add in is that a lot of what can happen in the Chinese economy and the things that she wants to focus on are going to be out of his control. And I think the Biden administration in October really made it pretty clear their attitude towards Chinese development with the regulations trying to deal with banning for um, chips and all issues around semiconductors. That will have a major impact on China's um, development potential. And I think one of the interesting questions that comes out of this is what is Washington's end game? Is this one attempt to try and force China to come uh, to negotiate around things that it's been um, criticized for from Washington for a long period of time? But actually the federal government has a lot of powers. I mean, there's a lot more things it could do really to undermine uh, the Chinese economy should it wish to do so. And I think it sets a challenge for China because in one way it has to react, doesn't want to appear bullied, but things that can react, well, it could say, we won't export any more rare earths. Well, but it can find rare earths in other places. Uh, and most of the other things that China can do will also damage itself. So I think there's a there's very central constraint on the government of China's economy now, which is well beyond Xi Jinping's control. Just to add, uh, you know, this idea that Ali Fung or somebody else might be the liberal, uh, you kind of reply with uh, Liu He, uh, who was supposed to be the liberal uh, last time. A, a friend, I understand, of uh, Kennedy School train. You know, and uh, he seemed to have bent to the wind uh, that he was facing. Um, so, you know, yeah, maybe Xi Jinping will wake up and have, be a neoliberal. Uh, I, I, I doubt it. Uh, you know, uh, you can always hope for miracles. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting discussions is, you know, does China really have a sufficient technological base where they can build and develop, innovate in these technologies? And they certainly have a large technological base, uh, but there's a time element involved. How How quickly can they come up with new chips and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I'm rather discouraged by the Biden administration. Um, uh, they they seem to really, um, they really seem to want to challenge China in some very fundamental ways. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a, sense that if we constrain them this way, but give them an out this way, that it'll work, that you can lead them to what the United States thinks would be a more a friendlier, more compatible polity. And if you challenge China across the board, I think it's a, ultimately a losing battle that would be unintentionally go into a cold war, which could have some very nasty ramifications. So where is that out? Or if you were giving advice to the administration, what would that out path be? And if we look at this board here, right? Yeah. Who would you be providing an out to? Well, I guess we better not do it to Holy Fung because you don't want to set up the people that you think are liberal. That, 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 that's one way to ruin their careers. And I don't think very many people in Washington think Holy Fung is liberal or neoliberal at all. So. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, in any case, I don't know. I suppose that... Um, you know, that there are ways of, you know, I mean, we have this CFIUS project, 
that China is allowed to invest in some areas and we restrict other areas. And I think that, first of all, that that needs to be clear uh, what areas we welcome investment in. And of course, obviously, um, things like trade relations, uh, you know, China wants to participate in the global economy because exporting is a very important part of that economy. Uh, and so I think you have to make clear that you're not against China's economic growth. You're against certain things that they're doing in the economy or in the national security area that we don't like. Um, I, you know, I don't think the Biden administration has been clear about that. I think they've been much more across the board. We're just against China. And I think that China probably has made a judgment that Washington just doesn't want China to ever rise. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. I, I mean, the only things that are going to work is if it appeals to what people see as in the U.S. national interest. Mm -hmm. In there, I always kind of think of it in different buckets. You have issues of global commons, where climate change is obviously the most uh, obvious example. But there's also oceans, fisheries. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's categories of, um, what do you call it, global engagement in a set of other areas and global regulations, where it's going to be in the US national interest to at least reach some kind of accommodation with China. Now, whether there's a channel to bring that about, I'm very dubious about at the moment for the reasons I think you say, Joe. And you know, colleagues from China have you know, pretty much been saying to me, the general sentiment is no matter what, America is out to crush us. It doesn't matter what we do. Yeah, you know that's that's America's intent. I have no idea whether that's true or not, but that seems to be pretty widespread. Yeah, also on a very low statistical base <laughs> idea. I think I think that's a a bigger problem. Also, is that there's no real vision for what the U.S. wants overall, right? So you're like, oh, you know, I don't I don't want China to be so big and powerful. Well, what do you want, right? And so, I think we need a a new vision of what the world should be like that has to leave more room for developing countries, right? It can't just be the US, US and Western Europe and maybe a little bit of Japan running the world, right? And so until the US tries to make a more positive and constructive appeal to the rest of the world, you know, then you're going to come across as basically trying to rewind the clock with no future vision. And that's not going to be very compelling to the new markets coming up, right? Africa, for instance, or India or Southeast Asia, you know, where people need an alternative, right? They need an alternative market than China, they need an alternative investor than China, and they need an alternative vision than China. Otherwise, they're going to be like, well, you know, okay, you're just the bitter old man, and, and they've got a vision for the future, right? So I think that that is a, is a bigger overall problem that we're facing. Mm -hmm. so just to shift this then to foreign affairs more broadly, right? One of the things that came out from this party Congress is the continuation of Wang Yi as um, uh, as a key figure in terms of shaping Xi's foreign policy. Again, this is somebody who was over the age of 68 and is being kept on. Um, also on the military side, right? Um, Zhang Wenka um, being kept on on the military side. So I just wanted to invite you all to um, comment a little bit on foreign affairs, uh, military, and so forth. Um, certainly, these are signs of what um, you all have all highlighted, right? Beijing has read um, Washington and perhaps the West as a whole or the liberal uh, alliance that Washington has managed to put together is responding a certain way and shoring itself up in a certain way. But are there any signs that came out from um, beyond what you've already highlighted, Tony, in the general secretary's uh, report about the headwinds about China needing to sort of steal itself for rough waters ahead um, that, you know, I think are worth drawing out to our audience. No, I don't think so, given what I already said. I mean, I uh, think Joe has also said, or as Lucy, you know, about the obsession with national security, how much can you keep focusing on that? The other interesting uh, appointment, though, um, which I think is going to be important for foreign affairs is uh, Qin Gang being appointed clearly, you know, presumably one might think would become foreign minister down the road. 
that to me highlighted, at least in Beijing, there's a recognition of how important the relationship with the US is going to be, and that they need someone who is very good at defending China's interests, but also knows how to talk to Americans. Um, that struck me as one sort of important issue uh, in terms of uh, appointments. Can I say as a journalist, um, you know, it's a lot easier to cover Chinese economy than it is to cover the Chinese military. Um, so on the economy, you know, we know the preferences of people down to the vice premier level or the vice minister level, right? We've often met these people. And, and of course, so have people like Tony um, and Joe uh, and Yuha. So these are all known entities. We kind of know their preferences. We know if their child went to the school in the US or not, or, you know, like, there's a person there. The military, like very, very little understanding of who these people are and very little ability to report meaningfully on it. Um, and also very little understanding of how beholden Xi Jinping might be to the military. Um, and I suspect the answer is a lot, um, but it's really hard to know. And there's really only maybe two reporters, foreign reporters in Beijing uh, that cover this with any degree of um, sophistication. Um, but it's kind of a big black box, I would say, from the media's point of view. I've had a couple of interactions with people in the Chinese embassy in Washington recently, and it sort of surprised me because it was very forthcoming, very friendly, none of the wolf warrior sort of stuff. And my <laughs> first impression was maybe this is wolf warrior stuff didn't get us very far, so maybe we won't need to set a new tone. And, I'm not sure that that's uh, if that's the case that it's bubbled up to any uh, higher level. Uh, we'll see. Um, I'd like to think that that's the case. On the other hand, what I really worry about is if they're talking to somebody like me, it means they can't get an appointment with anybody important in Washington, <laughs> and they admit that uh, that you know that they cannot um, go out and talk to a member of Congress. You're not the ambassador. They'll talk to the ambassador if you're a senator, but nobody lower than that. Uh, so there's literally nothing for them to do. We used to have over 100 official dialogues with China during the Obama administration. Right at the moment, we have absolutely zero. By the way, our diplomats in Beijing can't talk to anybody in Beijing. So there is a certain equality of the relationship there, um, which is, you know, it's really... Terrible. We do need, you know, what you ask, what can you do? Open up. Uh, the idea of talking is really, you know, it's, it's important. Um, it's certainly better to talk than to not talk. And right now, we are just not talking. And, you know, you mentioned climate and so forth. There are, you know, not to have any working groups mm -hmm. at all suggests that in neither capital is there much enthusiasm to have any talks. Uh, Needless to say, there should be mill-to-mill -mill talks. Um, by the way, the uh, other interesting appointment is Hu uh, Fang, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, other person on the military commission with Zhang Yusha. Uh, <clears throat> his appointment two terms ago or two rotations ago was uh, the Western theater. And so the Indians don't like him because they regard him as being behind some of the conflict there. Uh, and now the most recent appointment was in the Eastern Theater and people in Taiwan are not excited about that. Um, I don't know whether really understanding the Taiwan issue as he should from a military point of view, uh, that could either be bad that he is prepared, knows how to attack Taiwan or whether it's good because he says, Oh, gee, this is a pretty tough battle, and I, I want to put this off. So we'll find out. Uh, but at least you have somebody in there to watch closely to see what he says about issues like Taiwan. Yeah, one thing uh, Joe said, and amongst the others, which is very important, is, you know, I'm old enough to live through the original Cold War. And uh, you're not the you, only one. No. <laughs> but you know, even in the worst points of that, there were channels of communication with right. the Soviet Union. And they were maintained and they were considered important. And there were guardrails built 
to try and stop things escalating out of control. And what concerns me most in the relationship is with the arrogance in Washington, the arrogance in Beijing, those channels aren't there. And you can see a situation where you have an incident, an accident at the local level, which can um, you know, expand very quickly. And no one really knows how to be dealing with it because those channels have not been tried. And in fact, they don't actually exist. <clears throat> Hopefully we don't have a PT3. Uh, yeah, right. EP3. EP3 uh, thing. I, I, just one comment. Uh, you know, the Biden administration has cast foreign relations in general, and particularly with China, into this contest between democracy and autocracy. You're not going to create a peaceful, stable world with that framework. Um, it just will not work. And uh, something that the journalists ought to push back against. Well, I think it is a problem, right? Because there's like good guys and bad guys yeah. in how you cover things, but then that does create a problem for international relations. Um, and I think the sort of democratization of public opinion when it comes to foreign policy could make it really difficult, right? Yeah. So, you know, witness Obama met, I don't remember who in Asia, and then he got attacked for bowing as he shook his hand, you know, like it, it's this very personalized kind of nastiness makes it difficult for politicians to act in a sort of national interest, um, which is something that MOFA has been saying for a long time about the Chinese, uh, you know, neo uh, Maoists, um, and nobody was sure whether to believe them or not, but I think it's definitely a factor in US, mm -hmm. yeah. Just on Taiwan, I think, uh, I know this is on a lot of people's minds, and then, you know, journalists like to talk about Taiwan because, you know, this is, Something people want to see, right? You know, you know, the uh, you know, war is is very um, undesirable, but this is something that people want to see in, in, in newspapers. I I still think that uh, a war with Taiwan is very very unlikely, uh, even uh, less likely than, for example, China in the nineteen fifties. You know, Mao actually was seriously considering a war with Taiwan at the time in the, in the early nineteen fifties. I think now it's very very unlikely. Here are my two reasons. Uh, one is, you know, the Russian now, you know, so, so in the last 10 years, right, this has been a topic in newspapers that, uh, you know, uh, she wanted to have a war with Taiwan. And then the Russian now, given by a lot of the analysis, is she wanted to start a war to justify his third term, right? And then, you know, he wanted to start a war to say, you know, now we need a strong leader to lead the war. Now we need a third term, fourth term, maybe. And then now he has a third term already, right? So for that reason is gone. Right? So he doesn't need to start a war to justified anymore. The second reason I think is really important how U.S. has made it very clear that when there's a war uh, between China and Taiwan, U.S. will unequivocally uh, um, intervene right, on behalf of Taiwan. I think that, that has a huge impact on how Chinese government calculates the cost of the war. I think the, the war with Taiwan will be very, very costly, and then China is very unlikely to win. Even they can win, right? The cost of governing Taiwan is very, very high. I mean, just, Thinking about the, the cost of governing Hong Kong, right? You can think about all the troubles Beijing is having, and then you know, thinking about the, the cost that governing the, of governing Taiwan that is just too much for uh, Beijing to handle. Right now. So yeah, I think Beijing was really taken aback by the strength of uh, Western unity and sanctions on Russia. I think they thought it was going to be like Crimea, that you know, would be some sort of grumblings and complaints, mm -hmm. but after a few months, things would go back to normal. I think that is a major deterrent. I, I was just in Taiwan and it was, people there were much calmer about this than people here. And it was so like, yeah, but we've been living with this for 60, 70 years. So it's, a, and the, but I thought one of the interesting things that I heard there was somebody said, you know, there's the pressure on um, domestic tech industries and other significant industries. But they were saying what was interesting to them was there'd be no moves against any Taiwanese businesses, mm. which they felt was sort of reassuring. So one last question before I turn it open to the audience. One of the um, images lasting from this part of Congress was, of course, uh, the former General Secretary Hu Jintao being escorted. So I just wanted to ask, if anyone wanted to weigh in on the tea leaves or how you read on um, the videos, which have now broke, been broken down frame by frame, whose hand is placed on who to bring who down a certain way. Um, any commentary from this panel? 
<laughs> so having stood where the cameras were standing, um, I I was one of the people like looking at all the frames. Um, and you know what happens is the Great Hall of the People is really large, first of all. Um, and there's kind of a stage, it's like a huge stage, right? And they're all lined up there. And then there's the ground floor and the second floor, and then there's the mezzanine up here, which is where all the journalists are. And so initially when this first broke and we saw the short clip, I thought, wow, that's a really cold move. You know, you wait till the foreigner journalists come in and then you kick the old guy out, right? It's almost Shakespearean and it's <laughs> um, theatricality. Um, but now I've seen the longer clips and it looks like what was happening was the foreign journalists, you know, you come in and there's all this clanking around and they're all setting up their cameras and focusing. And, you know, they were kind of focusing around and checking out who's who. And, and you can see in the corner of, I think it's Channel News Asia's camera. So if you want to see the really extended dance version, you Google Channel News Asia, Hu Jintao. Um, and, and Hu Jintao keeps like going with this. And then Lee Jun Shu takes his stuff and puts it back down, and he can tell picks it up. And it does look like he thinks he's about to give a speech or something. And Lee Jun Shu is really treating him like an old grandfather who's kind of lost it, you know. And I have a family with a lot of elderly people, so I, I know the body language of this. Um, and then finally, Xi Jinping, and unfortunately, at this exact moment, somebody walks in front of the camera, but you can see Xi Jinping like telling the orderlies to come over and then explaining to them again about these papers. You know, he's pointing to who and he's like, the papers, the who, the papers, the who, and then they come in and take him off. So it really, although I th first thought it was premeditated, I have now totally switched my view. And I, and I really think that they were dealing with somebody who, you know, you'd think that these people just sit there like stuffed shirts, but uh, in fact, it seemed like he was really confused and that she was worried that there was going to be this commotion next to him uh, throughout the ceremony. Um, so that was sort of my read on the longer one. You have a different opinion. No, I don't, I, I don't see the positive value for Xi Jinping in, uh, you know, having at that point humiliating Hu Jintao. He was already humiliated enough. And uh, but my view on it is probably as valuable as Chen Minar at the 19th Party Congress <laughs> being the successor. I think you still might be right about Chen Minar. <laughs> Taking the long view. Yeah, I also think you know he doesn't need to you know Xi Jinping doesn't need to publicly humiliate Hu Jintao because you know kicking out Li Keqiang, kicking out Hu Zhongwei is it's already not right. That's the last thing. Because the mission he can do, he doesn't need to you know put this drama on the stage at the time. And also, you know, now all the media are focusing on that event, which is, you know, setting the center from Xi Jinping himself. I think that's something that Xi didn't want to do. I want journalists to take a very strong directional microphone so they can tell what Hu Jintao <laughs> said to Xi Jinping. So let me open it up uh, for audience members. Uh, you don't know, do we have a moving mic? Okay, so if you have a question, uh, I'm just going to ask just to get the conversation started. If there are any students in the audience who have questions, let's take a few students' questions first. So if there are any students. Okay, we will open up to general questions. And again, um, if you would please identify yourself uh, before asking the question. So we have a question over here. We're going to run the longest way around. Just so. Okay, You're young and good shape. I just go along with it. And uh, now I'm a uh, fellow at Ash Center. So, my question for uh, all of today's uh, powers um, is say that if you have um, one minute, Face to face with Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, that one minute to make a recommendation about what he or China should do in the situation. What will that be? And also, the follow up to that. Now, if you have this one minute with Biden, <laughs> what would you tell Biden? <laughs> 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 I 
Well, I think on the Biden one minute, I think uh, Joe, Lucy, and I have all pretty much answered that, that it needs a more nuanced and sophisticated approach on how to deal with China, which in, you know, really does go back to what they talked about earlier, you know, being confronted, but also being cooperative. Um, with Xi Jinping, um, I suppose it would be, I mean, you can't get, if you only got a minute, you're not going to get into any details of any policies. So I think it would be just be simply to keep himself open to uh, different voices and different opinions and to try and weigh those seriously. That's why you'd only get one minute. Well, I'm not, I don't think I'll even get in. <laughs> I get about 10 seconds, I think, you know. Yeah. Having just written 500 pages of historical nihilism, I don't think I'd get out of the book. You know, I, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, Xi Jinping would not take any advice from me or my ilk. Uh, um, you know, the, one of the interesting things about the work report, and there weren't very many, was that he really criticized the weakening of the party uh, in the past, presumably Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, that you were on a down slope. And I didn't particularly see it that way. There were elements of that around. Certainly, but it was also an opportunity for China to really build rule of law, um, to build a significant state, which is, of course, what she does not want, because that means a weakened party. Um, but it seems to me that that would help solve the problems that we've been talking about uh, this hour, as we see uh, she's constricted view of politics clashing probably with some of the economic things that he probably should be doing. Um, so I think you'd say it was a misreading of history, um, and I don't think he would agree at all, and I'd have <laughs> less time in there than Tony. I, you know, I have two versions of this, but I see, see I think the one version is what I wish to say, the, and then the second version is what I will actually say. I will say that uh, <laughs> the thing I will actually say is stop zero COVID and import a modern mm -hmm. you know, what yeah. to say, and then the things I wish to say is, um, so presidency, think about your legacy, right? Uh, you will be more likely to be remembered if you, in history, right? Be remembered in history if you open up China, right? Make China better, right? And then if you keep doing what you are doing now, you will be hated in history. And that's what I want to say. Right? And probably couldn't say it. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm a journalism student, but not decent. Um, my question is there were so many um, rumors or speculation about the reopening of China these days, but she just reinstated the um, success of the zero COVID policy um, in the party Congress. So what do you think of those rumors and what's your own speculation? Thank you. You think of what? The rumors COVID. about the zero COVID. COVID. You watch it. Said. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's helpful to think about the reasons why they started zero COVID policy. You know, there are a lot of rumors about the reasons why they started zero COVID. But for me, I think one of the most important reasons is uh, think about, you know, Chinese cities, even some of the, the smaller cities, you know, not the provincial capitals, you know, the, the cities all the, the, the provincial capitals, they have millions of people. And then, you know, imagine 10% of those people get sick and then they all go to the hospital. That would crush the local public health system. I think that's probably the most important reason they started so COVID. And then I don't think that reason has disappeared, right? Because, you know, once you open up, uh, there will still be, you know, 5% to 10% of people who get sick and then they want to go to the hospital. But the same worry continues. So I think those rumors uh, uh, saying, for example, one of the rumors saying in March, right? March 2023, they will open up. But I, I don't think there will be a timeline. I think it really depends on uh, uh, the situation of the pandemic, as long as there's local spreading, and then as long as the central government worries about local public health systems, I think it won't um, completely open up. But I, I do think that gradually they can do this, uh, but not very sudden. I think you have to remember that from China's point of view, zero COVID has been a real success, right? So the point of zero COVID was to have as few deaths as possible from COVID, 
And that seems like that that was what was handed down, right, to everybody. No deaths, no COVID. That's it, right? And and sort of other things are, are peripheral problems then. So it's been a success. So what has to happen is to change the metric for what is success, right? So that every local government official now has a different met metric, you know, other than stop COVID. So I think that the rumors, and this is why I take them seriously, that the, what spread on Weibo was a document that said that a committee was being set up and that Wang Huning, or a working group, and that Wang Huning, who is the chief sort of ideologue, would be in charge of it. And what people read into that is that that would be a way that you're shifting the public perception in China and the public messaging from zero COVID to something else. And that the something else would allow them to kind of back out of the corner that they painted themselves in. That still seems very plausible to me. It's just you don't know when exactly that would happen. But in China, you know, covering China, how things can shift very, very quickly as soon as the KPI or the key performance indicator for the local official changes. And the minute that changes, things will change the next day and it'll be like it never happened. All right. So it's just a question of when and how they change that. The thing I would add to what uh, Yuhua said is more than the the city's problem is the rural healthcare system. I mean, if COVID got loose in the in the countryside, it would be devastating. You really would be looking at millions of deaths. I think. Then I think there's other things they can do. Vaccine nationalism has made it more problematic for China mm -hmm. that their vaccines work but not work so effectively. So you could. Uh, improve uh, the quality of vaccines, uh, which would help. And then what they're doing now, having ignored the elderly, they're now rolling out campaigns to get vaccinations for the elderly to provide protection. Then I think what they could do, and I think this is what they will start doing, is I think before the party congress, there was whatever it was, 100 lockdowns or whatever, I think a lot of that was local officials just showing fealty to Xi Jinping and not wanting to make a mistake as much as doing it out of a kind of health logic. So there, I think Lucy's right. If some kind of metric is laid down, um, you know, local officials will respond to that. And then you might not get so many random uh, severe lockdowns, which could improve gradually the situation. <clears throat> question back over there. And then if, um... If um, whoever has a second, Mike, um, if you want to hand it to another hand that's off that way, we'll, we can keep the flow going. Thank you for this wonderful email. Uh, I'm in from law school. So I have a question about the, uh, the concept about the uh, Chinese modernizations, which propels the uh, these 25 countries. So uh, the Washington Post commanded on this uh, the, the Chinese modernization process by the party had already created a new choice for humanity with its unique path to modernization and not to China's images as an alternative to Western democracy. So I was wondering whether this concept could be a key concept which dominated in the following years, both domestically and internationally. And I was uh, able to hear your comments and understanding of this concept. I'm not sure I heard all that. So the question about the idea of uh, modernization of Chinese 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 China will go its own route and uh, won't be, uh, you know, upset by uh, Western notions of uh, uh, modernization and so forth. I, I can recall some of that certainly in the 1990s. Uh, so I think this has been around for a long time. Uh, she, of course, has made a much bigger deal, if you will, of maintaining the party in power. Uh, which goes back to some of the uh, fears that Tony mentioned. Um, and, you know, he he's made a much bigger deal of uh, not being upset by the um, 
what universal values and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I think the question is whether there's some, some combat compatibility between his notion of Chinese modernization and maintaining a uh, harmonious uh, world order. Um, you know, the, he, he really uh, has much more of a West anti-Western sense uh, than certainly Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao, not to mention Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and so I think that that's the, the key there in understanding his notions of Chinese moder modernity, yeah. Can I also add that it's, you know, it's not modernization per se, it's modernization in the areas defined by the state. So any of you who have WeChat wallet versus Bank of America here, know that Chinese online finance is really merry, 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 much more modern than American online finance, right? It's, WeChat wallet is so great and you can do so many things in the WeChat financial universe. And that's really modern, right? It's like ahead of the whole world. But for some reason, the Chinese state doesn't recognize that as the kind of modernization that they want, right? So they want modernization or science modernization that's very explicitly tied to the state's goals, but not necessarily tied to the goals of you know, consumers who use it. Um, so that's sort of an irony that I've always found mm -hmm. and never really understood about how China approaches modernization. Yeah, but I think in terms of policy, I mean, there's a bundle of things that he's put under Chinese style modernization, all of which have policy consequences. It starts with party absolute leadership, then there's common prosperity as a major goal. Um, the um, state dominance within the economy. And then it talks about whatever the phrase is for people's all around people or complete people's democracy. Mm -hmm. So it does have like six sort of headings underneath what he says is Chinese style modernization. And those I think are indicators of what policy will be moving forward. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for holding this opportunity for all the students and scholars to discuss and uh, learn. So my question is short and simple. Um, very recently, uh, the German representatives, uh, including a lot of um, German enterprises and uh, the prime minister of Germany, um, they just came to China and have a very quick tour. And um, it seems like they went very well, of, you know, cooperating in um, recent issues and then future uh, plans. And uh, I just want to know, do you guys think, um, is it like an, a, a fog camouflage for, you know, like a releasing a signal of, oh, we're reopening again? Or do you think it's really something in the central polyburo they have, they have some um, minds changed and they really think about um, finding something different as people thought about, you know, getting locked down and getting way back before open the reform um, economy policy. And can you identify yourself? Uh, I'm not... <sighs> I'm someone very passionate about like uh, what's going around the world, so that's about it. I'm sorry, we do have a rule at Harvard that if you're asking a question, you do need to identify yourself. So could you please just... I, I, I'm a student here in Boston, yeah. So, <laughs> if that's the only matter, I'd like to ask it. This is an open rule, right? We do have an open discussion system for that. I would like, I mean, unless if you could just identify yourself by name. A name? I didn't Why? think that's fly. Other, others here have been doing that, right? So, it is a rule that we have here at the Fairbank Center for open discussion, right? That it is safe. Well, I wasn't notified by this such a rule. I mean, okay. I mean, if you'd like, we can move on to the next question then. I, I, I do want to just state that, right? I mean, we do support an open questioning policy, but I do want to just also iterate it is important that we um, make sure that every speaker is identified um, when you ask a question. So if you don't wish to do so, I can move on. I guess you can call me K if that's possible. Move on. <laughs> Speakers are you? 
Do you wish to move on? Or do you wish to? I guess my just very shortly. I think my interpretation is uh, because uh, China knows that U.S. China relations are not going to improve in the next uh, ten years, maybe. And then I think Europe will be the next uh, partner, possible partner for China, right? For both trade, you know, for direct investment, you know, uh, technology. So I think that you know, Germany is the leader of, of Europe. So I think that's my interpretation. It's not about you know um, sending a signal, but just you know shifting. The target uh, from the U.S. to Europe. Okay. Ready for that next question over here, please. And again, just I did state this at the beginning. If you can please identify yourself before you ask your question. Hi, I'm you know, I'm a student in the IIT program, and the um, question is about since uh, at some point we mentioned it seems uh, it's uh, she's more looks like a reverse from uh. The political rule made by Deng uh, Xiaoping. However, I, I was wondering what about another perspective that his economic de uh, development was the center of policy making and the legitimacy. Do you think, like, uh, if we are deviating from that path also, so the way it sent uh, would uh, economic development still matters for the CPG rule? And what will uh, make bring change to maybe the future economic development model of China? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I get the economics questions. Um, <laughs> I think economic development matters very much to the CCP. It's just how they define it and what they see, right? So, you know, one of the really valuable reforms of the Hu Jintao administration was to try to have Chinese statistics reflect much better things that were not SOEs, right? So, um, in terms of the population, right? So not just reflecting the urban SOE workforce, but also reflecting migrants and where they actually are. Um, and then in terms of the SOEs, not just reflecting, you know, I, I dealt a lot with steel, I covered steel a lot. And you'd see really ridiculous statistics coming out of the China Iron and Steel Association, which only showed the steel that was being produced by SOE steelmakers. Hmm. And 50% of the steel at the time was being produced by private steel companies, right? So I, I think one of the problems is, you know, when we first learned computer programming in like fifth grade or whatever, and they said you learned garbage in, garbage out. So, you know, I think the Chinese state sees a certain subset of the Chinese economy in very sharp relief. And they have kind of a fuzzy view of the rest of the Chinese economy. Um, and so I don't think it's the economic development doesn't matter. It's just that they're responding to signals that are very distorted from one part of the economy. Um, and, and I think you can see that behavior, especially as she has shut down a lot of these reforms that who and when tried to put in to give them more visibility. You know, those channels have been shut back down, right? Private, private industry associations have been kind of shut down. Um, foreign uh, and Chinese uh, investment banks have been pressured not to give their real opinion. You know, local governments, local officials, they've got a baba -ba and show they're growing by 8%. They can't admit that they didn't grow this year, right? So all of that creates this kind of systemic blindness. So I think she probably thinks he is doing the very best thing he can for the economy. I just don't think he's got very good information coming in. Um, and Bill Xiao, I'm a retired but I have a critical question and excuse on politics. Um, before the 20th Party Congress, there's a great deal of speculation that the Communist Party would change its constitution and put uh, Xi's thoughts and uh, ideology into the Communist Party. Uh, constitution to make that guiding principle, but that did not seem to happen. What does that indicate to you? I, I remember those rumors. Uh, uh, they were around, and there is a rumor that, uh, for whatever it's worth, that the elders somehow blocked that. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, Xi Jinping has at least one more bite at the apple. Uh, so, you know, hold that rumor and it may be very useful in five years. Uh, it certainly doesn't uh, affect his rule. Uh, 
um, that will stay the same. Yeah, I mean, he certainly got in um, all the key things that were important to him into the Constitution. Uh, so at this point, I should think he'd be, you know, satisfied with that. And uh, it, it's not a very, um, doesn't trip lightly off the tongue, uh, <laughs> his thought. But uh, so I think as Joe says, I mean, he's got another several years that eventually it could just be Xi Jinping thought. But, you know, the the iterations in which, uh, you know, his thought for the new era is being used he, you know, confirms that his ideas and his views on whatever the subject is, is the dominant uh, guiding principle for China moving forward. So I still see lots of hands in the audience. I'm going to take the two questions over here, and if I can ask, we can run on mic over to this side of the room, which has not had a chance to ask questions. So the two questions here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first years from the year. I have a question about uh, Taiwan. Um, so, yeah, as Taiwan you know, has a very strong semiconductor industry, um, and it contributes to half of the chip uh, production of the world. Uh, but due to the tension between the US and China, and uh, um, Considering the security uh, reason, do you think that um, the semiconductor industries uh, will be put out? Can, can we take the question from the gentleman in front of you? <clears throat> My name is Easley Hamner. I'm with the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. And, uh, Nick Burns. Uh, I was hopeful that somehow. His presence in Beijing would make some difference. And does it, or am I just too naive? Okay, so, but uh, if whoever do you wish to take on any of the two questions, and then we'll close with everything other set two questions. Go ahead. Well, um, yeah, I mean, certainly um, companies like TSMC are going to have to reconsider their strategies. And, uh, you know, I think we have to be careful when we're talking about the chip production. I mean, what the U.S. is blocking is really the advanced levels. And I was just in Taiwan, as I said, and so I was speaking to some people in this, and they weren't really worried. They, they think basically China at best is 10 to 15 years behind. And only if they can bring in the right experts to sort of work on the development. So they sort of feel that they can still keep producing lower grade chips, and that's fine. But more of their advanced production, they're really looking for moving that or keeping that away uh, from China. And on Nick, I guess the advantage with Nick is that, you know, he's just a very senior um, person, you know, from the Korea service. Um, but, you know, in the current situation, he has to do whatever it is Washington uh, you know, is pursuing as its policy. He doesn't have a lot of lateral, really, I think, to move within that. And as Joe said, there's not a lot of channels of communication at the moment. And he can't really travel around the country either. So it's when, not much. When census, he doesn't have much of a channel to Washington either. Well, that's part of the problem. I mean, yeah. I think, uh, I forget, I, I think it was when Jim Sasser was appointed. A lot of people said, well, might not know about, a lot about China now, but it's someone who can talk directly to the president, and that's really what you want in a position. Yeah. So, okay, final set of two questions. The question was to the earlier discussion about uh, proposing a new narrative or frame for US China relations. And I wonder, because the current framing is autocracy versus democracy, and I wonder what Taiwan means. Uh, within this this frame, because for decades Taiwan has been emblematic and uh, badly that uh, almost as an advertisement for the U.S. cannot uh, as a liberal democracy as opposed to China. So I just wonder any alternative framing. You know, what does that mean to Taiwan? And I also think this the democratic framing domestically in Taiwan it means a lot to 
remind Thomas people of what there is to, to be protected and preserved beyond his mere existence and life. So I just wonder what could be a new narrative if any is needed, and what does that mean for time? I'll pass on to my colleague. Thank you. Um, there are several calm Thomas here. <laughs> yeah, and um, my question would be, uh, because uh, now we are trying, I, I, we, know, we all know that uh, currently war might not be possible, but we're trying to prepare for that, including the war situation. Um, but for us, uh, because war would like fundamentally change the way we live, so we are trying to find a way to like predict or to find a way to understand how uh, the CCP or she will behave in the future. So my question would be, um, we know that under these circumstances, it will be, become more difficult, but is this still possible or how can we like predict, predict the behavior or decision making of CCP or she on the future? For, uh, I want to ask that is because with like Professor Wong say, maybe currently now there's no reason for him to raise a war, but uh, that reason might dis disappear in the future. Um, on the different situation, like maybe the economic development or maybe other uh, factors. Yeah, and we know a little about the military, the PLA, something. And uh, under a uh, different scenario, maybe um, the war won't be that costly for she, or maybe he just wants to find something to become, to, to be uh, his uh, history legacy or something. So. And we uh, we all know that it's hard to predict his behavior and behavior now, just like Professor Wong said. Can I ask you to identify yourself? Oh, uh, my name is Yo Hao. I'm I'm a law student uh, at Harvard. Yeah. Thank you. So last my question. Thank you. To okay. summarize, what should Taiwan do? <laughs> and how to predict what Xi Jinping will do in the future? Uh, Read Renman Rebel. Uh, I, I say that half facetiously, but it's also a medium for the party to signal what its intentions are. Um, and I really think that if you uh, look at uh, the official press uh, consistently, they'll tell you what their priorities are. Um, I don't think this is hidden. Um, I, I think that uh, if they really want to attack Taiwan, you'll find some very serious signals in in the pages of the official media. Um, you know, uh, the description of democracy versus autocracy, um, I, I don't, I mean, we've, we went through a whole Cold War without using that sort of phraseology. I don't think we want to uh, put China in a, to be provocative to China. Uh, uh, we, we would like to, I think, defend or have Taiwan defend itself, um, but I don't think that that, uh, that framing helps Taiwan at all. Uh, it makes it much more the focus of that contestation, and that's not good for Taiwan. I think it's a valid point though, right? Because in Washington, especially among the Hawks, that becomes the main justification, right? So I worry about the hawks and maybe not even the hawks in Washington using China to get at uh, using Taiwan to get at China, and that is really dangerous for Taiwan. I think uh, I really admired the creativity of Taiwan over the last twenty years in its public global persona. Um, and, you know, I think the extent to which you can build that sort of soft power and, and popular goodwill uh, is very helpful in not having politicians think that Taiwan is a bargaining chip that could be bargained away, right? Because you're however many tens of millions of real life people, right? Um, so, you know, I think China, Taiwan's been really creative doing that so far, um, and it's a tough job. Um, but I think that that's that's you know helpful to this extent it can be done right to to create an identity for Taiwan and a perception that Taiwan is a place with an identity. Um, I think that that's helpful in terms of the public debate.
Um, so um, then I want to take a moment to thank all of you for coming out on this Tuesday evening to be here with us. Um, let me make three announcements before I close. Uh, the first is there's been uh, quite a bit of discussion about U.S.-China relations. I just want to remind all of you that the Fairbank Center, along with the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, will be hosting a conference next Friday. Um, it will also be live streamed, but please do register. Uh, that's focused on coexistence 2.0 and the U.S.-China relations. Is um, there a fee for registering? No, this is an open, free. it's a free, free. open conference, <laughs> but I, I would urge those of you who have not registered to please do so. Okay. Um, the second uh, point that I just want to make is we've got a lot of discussions about um, the Chinese political system, and we have several experts here who've written widely about it and so forth, but I do want to remind all of you in the audience that today is election day in the United States, and the polls remain open, and for those of you who have not voted, please do do so because democracy can land on all of us participating as active citizens. And the third thing is to just note for those of you who have voted, um, there is a set of drinks outside to continue the conversation. So please do join me in thanking all of our panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you and good day for visiting online. I don't do. 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 I don't do.